Hello, hello, and welcome to Odds on uh, Premier League. It's match day one, as always, with all things Premier League. We have Tom Rennie. How are you, Tom? How's been your summer? I'm doing very well. I'm glad to be back. Uh, I've been to America for a bit. We, were, we England nearly won the European Championship. Then, of course, you play Spain. You don't win it. Those are the rules. Uh, and I'm ready. And in many ways, England did win uh, the Olympic gold in soccer because Emma Hayes, she's English. She won it with America. Yes. We're claiming yes. it. OK, we're claiming it. We won the Olympics. <laughs> And uh, talking about America, another ex-Premier League stake in America, but this case, Mauricio Pochettino apparently taking over the yeah. USA, USA men's uh, men's team. Tom, before we get going with the show, just let me ask you one one, uh, one question quickly. Is there anything, anyone who could stop Manchester City to making it five in a row? No. No? All right. I was expecting that. I mean, look, no, of course not, right? I mean, look... I. I like the look of this Arsenal team, which we'll get into. I have yeah. loads of doubts about Liverpool as we record this. There's not been enough changes. I think there's a few decent squads this year, including teams like Aston Villa, maybe teams like West Ham who could have good seasons. But you're talking about, again, getting 95 or more points. There's maybe only Arsenal who could also do it. And if you're asking me to pick between Arsenal and Man City, as last season, I'm going to pick Manchester City. Plus that added spice this year is that the charges are coming up, the hearings are happening, and Guardiola, as we speak, is leaving at the end of this season. So that all coming together makes me feel like it'll be City, but we'll see. Guys, uh, remember you can join our monthly tips uh, competition and win cash prizes for that. You need to hit your Spidia's uh, website. And you haven't done it yet, also please do not forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notifications bell. Now, let's go on with the show. All right, uh, Tom, the biggest uh, event in England on Friday evening is Taylor Swift concert in Wembley, but then in Old Trafford, Manchester United and, uh, and Fulham are going to be opening the curtain of the Premier League uh, season. Ten Hag in the end kept uh, his job. We thought during or before the FA Cup final that he was not going to be present this Friday in Old Trafford. In the end, yes, he kept his job. He has some reinforcement, Matic the League, Masrawi, Licha Martinez, Lisandro Martinez is fit again. Garnacho and Yellow, they looked uh, sharp in the community shield. Bruno Fernandes extended uh, his contract. The feeling is that it cannot go worse than, uh, than it was last season, or maybe yes. Uh, and uh, also the feeling that they brought in Ruth Van Nistelrooy into the coaching staff just in case something happened with, uh, with Ten Hag along the season. In front, a Fulham team which lost uh, Palinha, which is, for me, Tom, a massive blow, maybe even bigger than when they lost Alexander Mitrovic at the beginning of uh, or last summer, before the start of, uh, of last season. Um, five years unnoticed in Tottenham was Ryan Sassanion, and now he's back in uh, in Fulham. They spend, uh, or they now have the most expensive Fulham player ever in uh, Emile Smith-Rowe coming from Arsenal. They lost Adarabioyo and, uh, and uh, Tim Rim. They prefer central uh, partnership. How do you see this uh, Fulham season with this uh, with this uh, with this summer, they took the three points last season in uh, in Old Trafford. Can they do it again tomorrow night? They did, and you make some great points on Fulham, and I'll, I'll get to them in a second. But, but if we start with Manchester United, I mean, I, I actually can't quite believe Eric Ten Hag is still there. Um, and that's not to say I think he should have been sacked. That's <laughs> that I thought he would be sacked because in the end, winning the FA Cup and the Carabao Cup in two seasons in charge, one of two. Champions League qualifications in those seasons. It's pretty good. It, it's pretty good. It's not It's not amazing, but it's not a, a tragedy. It's not been diabolical what he's achieved at Manchester United. Um, the issue for me is that I don't know if the football team are going anywhere. I don't know if he is going to be able to build on what he's already done. Uh, and the fact is, they spoke to everyone. They wanted Thomas Tuchel. They wanted other people to be in charge. They couldn't convince them. And so almost by default, um, he's remained as manager. And, you know, a lot of respect to him for, for swallowing his pride, realising he's never going to get a better job than this, and and re-signing and, and moving on from there. So we'll see what he does. 
Um, in terms of transfers, you know, they brought in Lenny Yoro, but he's injured. We don't know when he'll yes, play. They brought in Joshua Xerxes from Bologna. Had some good moments last season, but is that a difference maker? I mean, we'll see. I don't know. Mateus De Ligt, who's like defensive Alvaro Morata, seems to play for all the giant clubs and they sell him immediately. And Masraoui, he's all right. He's okay. I mean, I'm not sure he's a massive difference maker, but I mean, is he better than one Basaka? Is a, a, the question a lot of people will ask. And I'm, I'm not convinced that he is, certainly defensively. So... Have they improved? Yeah, maybe. I think maybe if they have a good run with injuries, which they did not get last season at all, they'll probably have a better campaign. Um, and, and we'll see. I think we know what an Eric Ten Hag Man United looks like at this point. Um, in, in terms of Fulham, the point you make on, on Polina is, is a brilliant one because he is, you know, look at the data of the last couple of years. It's like most interceptions, most tackles. He scores goals, most bookings. Uh, a leader of the team in so many ways. And... I don't know if anyone at the squad can replace him. They certainly haven't brought in a replacement um, in that position. And you mentioned Smith Rowe. I don't know, 27 odd million, wasn't he? I I'm not convinced by that. Perennially injured, hasn't really developed in the last two or three seasons. He's kind of the replacement for Tom Kearney, who's now 34, 35, and yeah. has not been able to get into the team. So it's it's not a replacement for Polina, who may well come in, uh, but at the minute hasn't come in. So. I don't know about Fulham. They look undercooked to me. I think offensively, they look uh, weak. I'm not sure the players that were up front last season will step up again this season. Uh, I think defensively, I'm not impressed by the players they have in there. Tim Ream was so important. Tosin played the majority of the games. That leaves you with Issa Diop and another at centre half, which is not particularly encouraging. I don't know. I think Fulham might look better by the end of the window. Right now, they haven't made enough changes. Going into this game... I, I can't see anything other than a comfortable Manchester United win. Right. Fulham look undercooked. Man United have been pretty decent at home last couple of years. Who's going to score the Fulham goals until we see it? I'm going to say nobody. So I picked out a few. My top tip here is Man United win to nil. Home win against Fulham on Friday to start the season comes in at 3.25. A double your money bet. Mm. That's really strong. And I'll be taking that. A minus one handicap. It's a bit dodgy. It means 2-0 and above. But... Yeah. I, I think that I can't I can't at the moment work out this Fulham team. And I do think Man United, with the players they have, can score goals. And also, I love a group bet. Also 3.25, long for Man U at home. 1-0, 2-0, 2-1, also 3.25. Some lovely bets there. Yes, absolutely. So that's the opener. Manchester United, Fulham, that's Friday night. Then uh, next is Ipswich, uh, uh, Liverpool in what used to be Jurgen's club uh, favourite kick-off time, 12.30 UK's uh, time for the second consecutive season. Tom, uh, a midfielder, says no. Thank you to Liverpool. Was Moises Caicedo last season. Now Martin uh, Subimendi, the European champion with uh, with Spain. So far, Arnes Lot does not have new faces. The squad is the same that implode at the end of last season. But of course, there is a lot of quality uh, there. And some preseason football uh, was really encouraging for, for Liverpool. Uh, they are, of course, uh, massive favourites here. Um, 1.4 almost 1.4 for, for Liverpool to win a straight in uh, in Ipswich. Uh, for Ipswich, Tom, I believe they are relieved to see that uh, Kira Makina in the end uh, is staying with them. They are back to the Premier League after uh, 22, 22 years. But is maybe this post-Club era the perfect time for Ipswich to dream to at least... Uh, take a point on uh, on Saturday or everyone should be here into the Asian handicap uh, minus for, for Liverpool in, in this one? I would avoid Asian handicap here only because you mentioned it there, 22 years. A huge achievement for Ipswich to have made it. They do play some really good football. I'd back them to score goals this season. There's no particular individual that stands out in terms of yeah. who's going to score 15, 20 goals. Liam Delap's a good player. Amari Hutchinson is a good player. Um, they're not strikers, but they are goal scorers. Connor Chaplin is a good forward. They've got one or two little talents who I think might develop across the season and be impactful. And on the opening weekend of the season, how many times have we seen it over the years with these teams that come up and we don't fancy them? But that first weekend, Liverpool at Portman Road, there may well be gargantuan performances from some of these players who might peak on the opening week and drop across the campaign. Yeah. I think that's probably what will happen. So I don't discount Ipswich here. I wouldn't say bet on them to win, yeah. uh, but if you are ever going to bet on Ipswich to win any game where the odds are going to be long, 
this would be it because first weekend of the season often does deliver something wild. Um, but in the macro at Ipswich, it's not a good enough squad. We did this last year. It's becoming harder and harder and harder to come up to the Premier League because the gap is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Even the mid-table teams now, even up three years, the gap between your squad and what's just come up is so big now. Can you invest enough in a summer to have a Premier League quality squad? All they've got to do is finish 17th. That's the battle. And they may well be able to make it. But I'm looking across the squad, seeing some of their performances from last season. And there's just, it's a championship squad with a couple of players who have got a lot to prove. We mentioned earlier on Delap and Hutchinson. So look, I think with Ipswich, they're going to struggle. In this game, there might be something. For Liverpool, it's fascinating they've not been able to attract people. I think signings will come in. Um, yeah. But I think that it's it's evident that Arnie Slot, after a long period of Jurgen Klopp, is assessing the players. He is assessing who is good, who is bad, who he likes, who he doesn't. And also, if you can walk into Luis Diaz and Mo Salah and Virgil van Dijk and Trent Alexander-Arnold and, you know, on and on and on, Dominic Sabasly, I think it's going to be important this season. You can walk into that. You ain't got to panic. He hasn't got to panic about changing this squad. He can work with anybody. I think you saw a bit on the US tour, if anyone saw any of that. There's going to be, you know, there was heavy metal football and there's going to be psycho slot ball. Like he is going to be pushing everybody wildly forward. Um, and I think you might see that a bit this weekend. So look, the one thing I feel confident of is goals. There's going to be goals in this game. So I'd be looking at the over markets here. If you forget the result and just look over 3.5 goals in this game, you'll make near double your money. If you want to add that with um, a score line, Go for Liverpool win and both teams to score. That's around 2.5, 2.75. You might get to double your money by the weekend. Uh, both teams scoring over 3.5 is again 2.5. Uh, but I fancy lots of goals here. I wouldn't be stunned to see Ipswich open the scoring and Liverpool go on to win the game. That's one of my favourite bets. It's always around five, six, sevens. Um, and so if you can time that right, you may make some money on that. But go for goals. Go for Liverpool. But if you feel brave and you want to bet on Ipswich, we ain't going to do it much this season. This might be the game. Yes, and, and maybe like uh, holding on that thing that you mentioned of after 22 years, they're going to go with everything, the, the atmosphere in, uh, in Portman Road. First half, a first half, double chance, take the odds for Ipswich to closer to, to two, which is not uh, not bad. The first half, double, double chance. From there, uh, Tom... Uh, we move to Arsenal Wolverhampton. Maybe for uh, Mikel Arteta, uh, the question is exactly the same as August last year. What they should do better to win the, the Premier League? We talked a little bit in the in the introduction. They reached 89 points la last season and still was not enough. Uh, for this campaign, even though they were the best team uh, defensively, they considered only 29 games last season. They strengthened that area with uh, Calafiori, who did great with Italy in the, in, the, in the Euros, and great with Bologna and Thiago Mota last season. In, in Serie A, which he, he could also provide uh, cover as uh, as left back in midfield. Declan Rice discovered as well during the season a new, more advanced uh, role, and now they are about to bring Mikel Merino in that uh, in that area as well. Uh, we don't know anyone reinforcing the the attack, but they scored anyway 91 goals last season, which was only five goals short of Manchester City. They won 15 games, home games uh, as well uh, last season. That shouldn't change against Wolverhampton. I get disaster, uh, Tom. No, they're going to win this game. And there's a few oh. variables, I think, that could make us some money on it. But in terms of, of the season, you mentioned the goals, and people mention that a lot. And I think it's absolutely right to highlight over 90 goals scored. But the trouble is, in two or three crucial games, they couldn't get the goal yeah. to get them over the line. And it's not about, really, for Arsenal at this point, the accumulation of goals across the season. They scored, what, six against West Ham? And there was a, a seven, wasn't it, against Sheffield United or something yeah. like that? You know, loads of goals in loads of individual games. Didn't win the league. Didn't win the league. Because in some games, at some moments, they didn't have Erling Haaland. They didn't have... Sergio Aguero. They didn't have, you know, Alan Shearer, whatever. You get my point. Thierry Henry. Yeah. There are individual players who are able to get that goal at that moment to win you the league. And, you know, Arsenal would have won the league with their points tally in like 20 of 30 Premier League seasons, yeah. right? The average across 30 years is like 85 points. We're not looking at the average anymore. City are not the mm. average. They're smashing the average. The average is dead. You've got to do better than the average. And... To do that, as we speak, Arsenal need to bring in that player. That player is not currently there. That's not to say they're not brilliant. 
They're absolutely brilliant, but they're not brilliant enough to beat Man City. Um, and that's going to be the problem. Briefly on Wolves, they look undercooked. I think, you know, a lot of teams have moved early. Chelsea, West Ham, one or two others have moved early in the transfer market. Man United, to this point, Wolves have not quite moved as yet. Um, I don't know a great deal about Jorgen Larsson and Pedro Lima. They've brought in, but I do know that losing Max Kilman's a big blow, who yeah. was so good for them last season defensively and a captain of the team. To lose the captain to, I think they would consider West Ham a rival. I'm not sure West Ham would consider Wolves a rival, but you know, they're in terms of teams who could be battling for 10th come the end of the season, Wolves would like to be there. I think West Ham might feel disappointed to be there. Um, but anyway, to sell him to, to West Ham will be a blow. So we'll see how they reinvest more of that money. Um, but they look a bit undercooked at the moment. Wolves did not have an amazing away record last season. Arsenal, you mentioned, great home record. I think that continues. Uh, one of the safest bets of last season with Arsenal's brilliant defensive record was Arsenal win to nil. I'm going to keep yeah. running with that. It's down to 1.83. So look, not an amazing amount of money, uh, but it's one of the safer bets of the weekend. Um, Arsenal went over 2.5 goals in the match. I just fancy them for a few goals here. I don't think they'll concede, and I think they'll score a few. That also comes in quite low at 1.62. I picked out some longer ones for fun because those are, are quite safe. Number one is Arsenal to score from a corner and win. That brings you in. If you find someone who can offer it, that's a double your money. They score from corners. So many corners. Declan Rice's <laughs> delivery, Saliba yeah. scores, Gabriel scores. I think Calafiori might score a few from corners this season. They have height. They have plans. And they're able to score a lot from them. I mean, a lot of the, the fact they came second last season was scoring from corners in tight games. So go on that. And that also brings me to William Saliba. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Saliba to score, I know. A Saliba to score from a header is 13. That's 12 to 1. Um, wow. It's a bit wild. It's a bit individual. But I think they'll score from a corner. And if they do, it's probably going to be him. Amazing. So that is Arsenal, uh, Wolverhampton. Then uh, we got Everton uh, in Goodison Park with uh, Brighton, which will be actually this is the last season in, in Goodison Park, the goodbye season in Goodison Park for, for Everton. If they would not have been docked eight points, uh, they would have finished 12th. Uh, Tom, just uh, below Brighton on, on goal difference last season. Um, Onana was sold, Amadou Onana was sold to Aston Villa, uh, but they managed to keep at least uh, brave wide. The problem with Dutch, uh, with Dutch, Tom, I think is they still seem to be the goal scoring options because uh, he has mainly Dominic Calvert Lewin and stopped counting. And Everton scored 40 goals, uh, which was only five more than uh, than Sheffield United. And uh, uh, but now Brighton comes without the Cherry. I'm personally curious to see what's uh, Fabian Hursel are gonna bring. To, to the Seagulls, they lost Pascal Gross, maybe kind of like, in my view, the same kind of blow that with uh, Fulham, with, with Palina. Gross has been uh, super important for them in the last uh, in the last years. Um, judging by the odds, Bukis looks like uh, indecisive. The last five home wins for Everton uh, uh, were all to nil and no more than two goals scored uh, on each of them. Is the goals under the one to look on this Everton Brighton? Definitely under. Definitely oh, under. Take the under, especially if you're going for an Everton win. Take the under for the reasons you mentioned. If Everton win, it's because they shanked a goal and they don't concede. Nothing's going to change at Everton, right? It's uh, it's a shame for, for Goodison's last season, but it's, it's a Sean Dyche team. They ain't going to suddenly reinvent the wheel, right? They're going to do <laughs> what Sean Dyche does. And yeah. you can't really criticize him for it because he doesn't come in saying, I'm going to do something different. Um, I like the signing of Jacob Bryan at centre half. I think he's pretty decent, uh, and I think he adds kind of height and power and whatnot. And uh, I'm impressed at Leo last season. Uh, Leon, forgive me. Um, but I think losing Anana, I don't know how much of a loss Anana individually is because I think Sean Dyche didn't quite like him. There was a few times on the bench last year. You're a bit like, what's going on? Um, but I do think they haven't replaced the quality in the squad. I think the squad has got worse since the back end of last season, all told. Um, and up front, you mentioned it. You cannot rely on Dominic Calvert Lewin. He should be fit for this weekend, we are told, but I guarantee you he won't be fit for more than 25 games across the season. That leads you to, what, Beto? Germany? It's not there, you know? So, look, if you're going to bet on Everton, what you do all season is bet on them to win in a low-scoring game. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, I I'll give you a little cheeky one here. I wouldn't be surprised if these two teams were in the bottom five. Uh, I have big concerns about, about Brighton. Now, we always say this, and they turn it on, and they win 6-0, and you're like, who's this guy I've never heard of, right? So that might happen, and by next week, I might drop this. Um, and, of course, we've not seen them. But losing Pascal Gross is huge. Um, I, I think he's been so important to everything good Brighton have done for such a long time. I think he's the 
the most assists and maybe even the most goals, certainly in the top three for goals they've scored in the Premier League. Uh, he and played everywhere. Everywhere. I see him play wing back on the right, on the left, yeah. defensive midfield, centre forward. So important, right? And then you look at the the players that are perennially injured. They lost Solly March uh, to injury last season, and we don't know as and when how fit he's going to come back. Tarek Lamptey, you know, always seems to be injured. You know, on and on it goes with Brighton. Um, and I think we're still not sure about Solly March for another month or so. Ferguson up front looks like he'll be injured for the first weekend of the season. You can't rely on him. So I don't know who they are. I don't know who the manager is. I don't know what they're going to offer. Um, but I do know I have no faith in in. Ever neither. So look, top tip, just go with under. Pick whatever score line you want and go with the under. Yeah. I'll personally be just pipping Brighton for this and under 2.5 goals in the match, only because it comes in at six. That's five to one. If you take Everton and under, it brings you in less than that, around four. I'm not going to bet on Everton until I've seen them a few times, but I wouldn't be surprised. Draw and under. Look at the under score lines. Good. And next then is uh, Newcastle. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, Newcastle, uh, Southampton. Newcastle last season, the fourth uh, best home record, Tom. Uh, 12 wins, four draws. They scored 49 goals at home. Uh, they still, the overall feeling was, of course, of, of disappointment. But this year, uh, they have does not have European football. Uh, to, to think at least during the during the week, it's understandable that they are chasing Margehi because yeah, first because he's a very good uh, central defender, but also because Newcastle conceded 62 times uh, last season. I'm surprised they haven't or they are not trying at least that I know trying to go for a top keeper as well uh, on top of a very good uh, uh, center back. And and so Hapton, uh, yes, they were the. The, the best team in terms of possession and passing Akuras in the championship, but Burnley did the same with the um, with the company. And once they reached the Premier League, they could not replicate that, of course, at the at the elite. Uh, we should go. We should have goals for sure in this uh, in here at least coming from uh, from Newcastle. Well, firstly, I'm not going to take any more Nick Pope slander from you. He's a top goalkeeper. I can't. Who are they going to get who's better than Nick Pope? He's brilliant. Makes great saves. Looks like Freddie Mercury. What more could you want? <laughs> um, you know, he's a he's a killer keeper. Um, but look, I, I think you, Newcastle were really interesting this year. In the macro of it, I think there's a few teams I mentioned earlier on who could have fantastic yeah. seasons. I think Aston Villa are one. I think West Ham are one. And I think Newcastle are one. And and the reason is you you mentioned it earlier on. No European football with this squad. They were so stretched and so thin yeah. last season that they kept getting caught because it was a Bournemouth game around Christmas. I, I don't even know who played. Like it was there was there was Lewis Miley who came through and played a lot of games, but then there was other teenagers. You're like, who's this kid? Who's this kid? They looked like children coming on. It was so short. It was the game where Kieran Trippier had an argument with a fan at, in the stadium. Yeah. So look. That's what cost them last season. That's why they're not in Europe this season. And I think they can shrug that off. And also, they have Alexander Isak, who is just getting better and better and better. Superb player. I think the same of Anthony Gordon. There was some talk they might need to sell him during the summer, but he is staying, and that's good news for for Newcastle. Um, So they've got that. Plus, as we speak, they still have Bruno Gimmer Rice. They still have um, Sandro Tonali to come back in. Harvey Barnes, hopefully he'll be fit for a while. Lots of positives around Newcastle. They've rightly picked out defence. Um, and I think it's likely Gay will come in. Lloyd Kelly is coming from Bournemouth. I, I think they'll get better in those departments. In terms of Southampton, um, yeah, look, I think the Burnley comparison was brilliant, actually. I think that's a really fair one because there are some really good footballers, some technical footballers in this in this team. The signing of Flynn Downs is really important. I think he was their best player last season. He's come in from West Ham uh, on a permanent deal. I'm, I'm not sure... I'm not sure if he's a Premier League quality player in, in truth, but we will see. There's been huge improvements in Flynn Downs over the last year, so a big test for him. If he plays well, Southampton tend to play well. Uh, but again, much like earlier on, still not a great deal of Premier League quality. Ben Brereton diaz had a last year at Sheffield United. He's come in, didn't do a great deal. Onoachu, the Nigerian forward, who's like nine foot tall. When he, he went on loan somewhere last season, played really well. He's come back into Southampton if he's in the squad. Are they going to be a crossing team? I don't think so. Sekumara, a couple of years of experience. I don't know. I'm still not seeing a great deal of quality here in the Southampton squad. They'll be in the bottom four, no doubt. Maybe even bottom of the league. And they're going to get walloped here, frankly. This will be a rude awakening. A huge jump up for Southampton. It's a horrible away day to start the season. 
Um, I think it might be the longest geographical distance between two teams in the Premier League this season, Southampton, Newcastle. So I think Southampton fans might need to leave like now to get there on Saturday. <laughs> um, Newcastle win this game. Look at some handicaps here. Win to nil is 2.75. It's quite nice. I can't see who's going to score for Southampton. Minus two, which is three nil or more. Uh, 3.25. Double your money. I think they're going to get a real spanking here. I wouldn't discount five nil to Newcastle United. This is going to wow. be welcome to the top flight for Southampton. So there's some money to be made in Newcastle, uh, Southampton. From there uh, to Nottingham Forest, Bournemouth. Tom. Last time between this side of the city ground, uh, the Cherries took the three points with the Dominique Solanke hat trick. Now Solanke uh, is now a Tottenham player, and that might help you explain why the bookies Tom they see Forest as favourites here, despite finishing uh, 16 points below uh, Bournemouth last season. Uh, Last season, actually, 20 of the 32 points that uh, Nottingham Forest collected were all won uh, at home. I just don't think that this time 32 points will uh, will, sa will save you. And Bournemouth had, of course, uh, a good season with Iraola, uh, 48 points uh, in the whole season. But they were inconsistent, too, because I remember they were pulled until um, the end of October. Then they became unbeaten between November and New Year's Eve winless until March and then they resurrected in the last two and a half months of the of the season but uh, without a striker that scored one third of Bournemouth's goals uh, what should be the realistic uh, ambition for them then? Um, I think these are two teams that are looking at 40 points first or 35 points I think there's a possibility both could go down um, um, I'm not sure I'd bet on it but I think they're going to struggle all yeah. season uh, for various reasons look on Nottingham Forest they actually have done some good business in the transfer window. It sounds mad to say because it's normally so erratic. But I think Elliot Anderson from Newcastle is a really smart and astute signing. I think that Nikola Milenkovic from Fiorentina is, is a really good player. Um, and they needed someone at centre-half um, with, with sales they've made. Uh, so I think he comes in uh, and will, will be their starting centre-half. Um, and I also quite like Jota Silva as well. I've always quite thought he would... He seems like someone who'd make one in three appearances and be brilliant for Wolverhampton Wanderers. You know, that sort of player. So I quite like that signing and I think he'll do well under Nuno as well. So there's a, there's some good, there's some good smart business. It hasn't been like wild nonsense, which they've done for the last few years. So I, I think that's a positive for Nottingham Forest. But in, in general, it's still a middling Premier League squad. They're still going to ask Ryan Yates to boot people up in the air for 90 minutes and, and try and stay in games. And also, if the last couple of years anything to go by, what they need, Forest, is a kick up the ass. Uh, and they might get it, you know, by losing eight in a row. And then suddenly they'll start winning. I'm not sure the motivation is going to be there for the opening day. We shall see. In terms of Bournemouth, you mentioned it. Solanke is just, it's a huge loss. It's such a monumental loss for them. He scored so many goals for them, led the line so brilliantly well, um, as well as Iriola did last season to turn things around from that awful start. Without him, it would not have happened. And the players they have brought into this point, they only sold Solanke a couple of days ago. So, you know, you've got to give them time. But the players they have brought in have not particularly, to my mind, improved the squad. Never been much of a fan of Araujo, who comes in. You know, I think it's good enough for Bournemouth. I'm not going wild here, but I, I don't think he's a massive improvement on someone like Lloyd Kelly, who's left. I, I don't see a huge jump there. Um, and beyond that, what are we looking at? We're looking at nothing, really. So you're relying on last year's Bournemouth without Dominic Solanke to go there and win. So look, this runs a toss-up. It's a total toss-up. I think that the odds are even across the board for win, yeah. for draw, for win. Kind of screams draw to me. And at the moment, with the jury out on both, I'd probably look, if you're going to bet on this game, safe bet on the draw. If you're going to pick a winner, I'd go for Bournemouth only because I think they are a better team in terms of the coaching and in terms of no changes. They're the one that can kind of pick up from where they left off last season, as opposed to Forest, who'll be a hot mess as per usual. So I'd go for draw, pick a winner, Bournemouth. Beyond that, I'm not going to do specifics with these two just yet. 3.70 for a, for a draw in that uh, Nottingham Forest, Bournemouth. Uh, and then to, to close the curtain on Saturday, we have uh, your beloved West Ham at home with, with Aston Villa. Uh, will be the debut for Julian Lopetegui, replacing David Moyes. We should expect maybe a more 
uh, entertaining brand of football with the Spaniard. The recruitment has been very good. Tom really the the summer, uh, Juan Bisaca, Max Kilman in defense, Guido Rodriguez. Yes, of course, Guido Rodriguez not Rodri, but he's he's done very well in 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 Betis in the last uh, in the last few years, and he's a World Cup champion with the, with Argentina as well. Summerville is a good signing, uh, and then full group, which for me, uh, I think this time uh, Tom. Uh, West Ham might be like third time lucky. I mean, after Escamaca, after Sebastian Haller, full group will be the man. I think he's going to be low by the fans and he's going to score goals, which is in the end the, the most important uh, thing for, for him and for and for West Ham. And uh, Villa, they strike them as well, the the team, the team which is going to be playing Champions League football, Onana in midfield, but they lost Diaby and Watkins, which is still the only threat for them uh, as a centre forward. Uh, do you think that both teams to score in here, maybe combined with goals over, should be the king here? I don't know. I expect goals with in, in this one. I think I'd expect both teams to score. And I think the recent pattern, certainly at uh, London Stadium, is draw. I think the last three have been 1-1 one, one, yeah. uh, between these two. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the scoreline. I'll tell you right now, that's what I'm going to be betting on. But look, on West Ham, you know, I'm really optimistic about West Ham. I think that Lopetegui is a is a brilliant manager, right? This is this is someone who I, I couldn't quite believe it when he was getting the job. And and some friends of mine who are West Ham fans were a bit like, oh, I don't know, isn't it just David Moyes again? And I'm just like, what are you talking about here? Like, and again, I love David Moyes, as you know. I think the time yeah, had, yeah. Had, had, had ended it, run its course, and it was time for a new voice. Four and a half years, a very long time for for this day and age. But Lopetegui is able to organize a team defensively. He can play David Moyes football if required, but he also is able to get exuberance from attackers that maybe David Moyes struggled with. And there are times this season, I can't believe I'm saying this, there are times this season, if West Ham are chasing a goal in this game, their front line could be Nicholas Fulkrug, Lucas Pakita, Mohamed Kudus, Jared Bowen. That could be their four. And if they're like, oh, it's not working, they bring on Crescencio Somerville, who's fantastic. Um, that's wild, right? If that was Tottenham, I'd say they can, can challenge for the top four. That, that's what I would say, right? It's because mm-hmm. I want it to happen because they're my team. I might not, but that's very good. And then the big issue with West Ham last year was defensive, right? They conceded 70 plus goals. Only the three teams that went down conceded more goals than West Ham. Um, Kilman, really good. Yeah. Tadebo, can't believe they pulled that off. I think they brought him in for two years and then to sell on. I think everyone's kind of agreed with that because the, the previous club couldn't get the money they wanted from Juventus. That's fine. Absolutely fine. Um, bring him in for 40 and sell him for 80, and you've, and they get some money and blah, blah, blah. That's the plan. Yeah. That was the plan with Paquetta, and it would have bleeding worked if it wasn't for the whole charges stuff. And then wan Can't believe, man, you wanted wan to go. Like, offensively, not amazing. But defensively, I've seen him stop Kylian Mbappe. You know, I, I've seen him stop some of the best players in the world. So really good signing. You add that to Bowen we've mentioned. You add that to Alvarez. You add that to Emerson. You add that to Ariola. I like this. It's I really a, like yeah, this. Yeah. This is a really good team. If they can make this work, this is a team who can get above 70 points. And 70 points is top three, top four. I'm not saying it will. I'm saying yeah. I expect 50. And I think 70 is possible. We shall see. Full Krug would need to score 20 plus goals for that to happen. Um, I don't expect it in week one. I, I think there's going to be maybe eight weeks for it to, to click into place and maybe a couple of nice Dolly home games, which they've not got in the opening couple. Um, but we will see. In terms of Aston Villa, you know, West Ham don't have European football. We mentioned Newcastle don't have European football. Villa do. Yeah. And they've got this Champions League, which is now expanded as well. So there's eight games they've got to play in that group stage before the knockouts. I think uh, February, yeah. early March um, starts in September. going to be tough. Gonna be really tough. Gonna be tough for the teams established in the Champions League to play eight group games. Uh, for Villa, who've not been in it uh, ever in in the Champions League era, gonna be really tough. And l- bringing in Nana is great, but losing uh, Douglas Luiz is gargantuan. It's a huge loss. That, that, that's not a like for like. Nana's got promise. Luis was near the finished article, so that's a huge loss. Um, I like Ian Matson. I think he's a good player. Um, I think losing Musa Diaby is not the big loss that people think it is. I think he he really trailed off as the season went on and wanted to make as much money as possible in Saudi Arabia and, you know, God bless him for it. Um, but I don't think Villa have got better. I think they're good and remain good, but have not got better. Um, 
My gut here says draw because this game often ends draw. I think West Ham's squad has improved, but is relatively new. We're going to see maybe six debuts in this game. Um, and in terms of Aston Villa, I think there's every chance they pick up where they left off at the back end of last season. So Screams draw, draw on its own is 3.6. 1-1 draw or draw and both teams score is four. If I was going to pick a winner, I would just shade for West Ham. It's a sellout at London Stadium. West yeah. Ham and both teams score is four. It's three, it's three to one. Um, I really like that. Uh, and it's group bet as well. 1-0, 2-0, 2-1 is 4.33. Those are very likely score lines. West Ham are going to have a good season. Um, why not start here with the win? So that is what's come back to me. And then on Sunday, we start with the uh, Brentford Crystal Palace. More important uh, than going into Monday one with Ivan Tony. I think for, for Brentford is that the Thomas Frank goes into his sixth full season in, in charge. He's the fourth uh, longest serving manager, I think, in, in, in English football. Um, for Brentford, the way... They start their camp their home campaign should be very important, Tom, because I was having a look at the fixtures and the first four away fixtures are against Liverpool, Manchester City, Tottenham, and Manchester United. So they need to start uh, collecting at least uh, points uh, at home quickly. Last season, 39 points. Uh, from then, they can do, of course, uh, much better than, than that. I want to see how Fabio Carvalho fits into Thomas Frank's uh, system. And um, for Palace, the idea or the expectation to see, I guess, if they can pick up from when they left at the end of uh, of last season. Mateta showed at uh, the Olympics that he's still on uh, on fire. He scored 16 uh, times in the Premier League last season. His career best uh, so far uh, is boasting to score here as well as it was the case with West Ham Aston Villa. The market to to look. Oh. Such a good question. I oh, I don't know how quickly Mateta is going to come back into the Palace squad and be yeah. ready for this game. That's 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 a doubt I have on them. Plus, you know, Elise has been sold, and so that makes me Ooh, hesitate a bit on both teams to score. Look on Brentford. I think there's every chance we're all going to underestimate them, and there's every chance they're going to finish tenth. You know, we've done it like four times now with Brentford, yeah. and we may well do it again. And your point on Ivan Tony. Look, I still think he's going to go this window. I think he's going to go because they have fattened him to sell right now. If they don't sell him right now for as much money as possible, next year, less. Next year, yeah. less. I think if they don't sell now, Ivan Tony stays there for the rest of his career. So, um, and he wants to go and they want him to go. They want that money to reinvest, <laughs> right? That's This is where they are now. They've got to a point where this is time and they can't get the offers. They can't get Chelsea. They can't get Man U. They couldn't get West Ham. They can't get Tottenham. Where's he going to go? Who's got the money? I, I don't know. Um, but I do think that going into this game with Brian and Bumo fit, you know, we didn't see enough of him last season. Ivan Tony and Johan Wissa, it's still a great three. It's still a really good, really buzzy, really dangerous trio. One of the best trios in the league, like top six, top seven trios of, of, of attackers. That's how good it's been uh, for Brentford. Um, I, I think defensively, there's, there's question marks there. I think last season, you could see some of the older guys were slowing. And you, they haven't quite replaced them with pace across the back line. That means three at the back. That means low block. That means trying to keep possession in games like this, which is maybe not their strongest suit. So there's question marks there uh, about Brentford that need to be solved. And I think maybe some pace defensively would help. Um, in, in terms of Palace, we mentioned it. Elise is a huge sale. You know, they were brilliant back end of last season. But I did say, I think to you, at the back end of last season... Was that a bad thing? They had that amazing run last 10 games because now everyone's seen Oliver Glasner's team. They've seen yeah. the tactics. They've seen what he does. You can work it out a bit. The loom manager bounce sort of wasted back end of last season. Or not. They finished 10th. That was impressive. Um, but at least say to be replaced by Ismail Assar, it's downgrade. Um, Mark Gay, not been sold yet, but when he is, will they be able to bring someone of his quality in? No, that'll be a downgrade. Uh, and Jean-Philippe Mateta, hottest point of his career, I wouldn't be amazed to see him push for a sale. I, I wouldn't be amazed. You know, he's never going to be as hot as this Mateta. Um, and does he want to be at Palace for the next four or five years? I, I don't think he does. And there's even talk today about bringing Wilfred Zahar back. If that happens, I don't know. I think they've got a really good manager. And I think they've got some really good players. You know, I, I don't discount what was done back end of last season. I like Kamada, who's coming from Lazio, once a Frankfurt. I think he's brilliant. Adam Wharton, good player. Um, I think they have a solid season, but I don't think spectacular. This game, I'm going to sit on the fence. Screams draw. Screams draw to me at 3.4. I'll I'll take that all day. I'd probably go the under, frankly. I, I wouldn't be surprised right. if this wasn't quite tight. Maybe 
a conservative under of under 2.5, maybe under 3.5. Draw under, under 3.5 brings you at double your money. I don't think it's going to be a thriller. If I was going to pick a winner, I might just shade for Brentford, but it's Graham's draw. Good. And then uh, the one before the last one is a big one. Chelsea, Manchester City in, in a Stamford Bridge. Uh, what a mess is this Chelsea, Tom? Last season, some players we, we got to know were changing in the corridor because there was not enough pace in the changing rooms at the training ground. Uh, so they decided to splash another 220 million and bring 11 more players. They assembled a squad of 50 seniors players. Why Why on earth would you like eight goalkeepers, 15 midfielders, nine wingers, seven strikers? Uh, and actually, there is a point which is not even a point of feeling sorry for Maresca. That's my view, because he signed for five years. He gets, a, he gets a huge payout and his reputation doesn't get even a scratch because everyone knows he had the, an impossible job managing this uh, this team. And in this context, then you play Manchester City in your debut. Uh City, they may have looked a little bit rusty last uh, Saturday in the community sheet with uh, with mm. United, but again, yes, maximum favourite to win the Premier League for fifth time in a in a row. Last time we saw a, a thriller four four in a Sanford Bridge. Are you expecting another goal feast in this one? I am, but I'm not expecting four four. I'm expecting yeah. maybe four from Man City. Uh, but maybe not four from <laughs> Chelsea. I mean, look, t- to your point on the squad, Enzo Maresca's got the best job in football. Six months of work and five years of money. Perfection. You can't argue with that. Um, and the players they've brought in, look, Todd Bowley and Bidadig Bali and, and the group running the club, they're running it like a, a money ball, baseball squad. Uh, they've experienced with the Dodgers doing that. And maybe as a business, it's going to work brilliant. Maybe as a business, it's going to work brilliant because you bring people in, you sell them on, you make money, you make profit. You're always turning over, turning over, turning over. But as a football team, I don't currently see how it's going to work. Um, Last year at points was diabolical without Cole Palmer, whose numbers, by the way, I I totally forgotten. say forgotten. I just hadn't really sort of logged it. 25 goals and like 15 assists in 40-odd games. That's wild. Crazy. That's unbelievable. That's all-time great Premier League seasons that guy had for Chelsea. That's why they're in European football. That's why they didn't finish 11th, because of one guy. Um, (laughs) And, you know, that's not a ringing endorsement of the business model. Don't get Pedro Neto. Don't see why they've done that, considering they've already got 14 wingers. Um, Don't get a lot of the signings, really. I mean, is Philip Jorgensen the keeper now? Or is it Sanchez? I don't know who's meant to be the number one now. I've not got a clue. Um, Tosin coming in, he's not as good as Trevor Chalabo. They're trying to force out. I, I, yeah. we can't, we can't do the whole thing. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. I don't know what the team is. I have seen them in preseason. They look shocking. We'll, we'll see what happens. Cole Palmer back for this game will hopefully make a big difference for them. In terms of Manchester City, you know the charges are, are coming uh, thick and fast now, right? We're hopefully going to get the hearings in September through December to find out what actually happened, what they're guilty of, or otherwise. Um, that will affect the season, right? That is going to be an overriding narrative in the next few months because we should have a resolution of sorts before the appeals and the legal challenges and all that to come. It's going to go on for years, but there'll be the first stage of resolution to this by the end of this season. That's going to affect Pep Guardiola. He's probably going to go at the end of this season. I think there are players who are going to go at the end of this season because they don't want to work for someone else. They also might not want to be tarnished by what happens. So look, again, it's all going to be up in the air. Um, and in terms of the team right now, the loss of Julian Alvarez, I think, is quite significant, considering that he might not have started every game, but he played in most games. He contributed to every game. And not only that, he was up front. He was on the left. He was on the right. He played in midfield. Um, he could come on for anybody. And when Harlem was injured, he could start in his place. So I do think that's a significant loss. But, you know, cry me a river. They still have Kevin De Bruyne, Jack Grealish, yada, 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 yada. So across the season, I still think City are going to win the league. I still think they're the strongest squad. But I think there are one or two questions to answer if they're going to be Champions League challengers. In terms of this game, the Chelsea defence during pre-season has been all over the place to the point yeah. where the manager has blamed Maurizio Pochettino on a high line. They're still playing. They clearly aren't listening to Enzo Maresca. Maybe they don't know who he is. Um, that's going to be an issue. Uh, and City, I think, can score goals anytime against anybody. And if Chelsea haven't worked out defensively, they're going to be in massive trouble. And a conservative bet here is double your money. I'm quite surprised by this. Minus one handicap, City. Two nil or more is three. Double your money? I'd take that all day. Absolutely take that. <laughs> I also would be looking at the over as well. Look at a City win over 2.5. Again, it's a double your money bet. 
I'd avoid Chelsea here until we've seen what's happening. Go with City and go City big. And then uh, the last one to close from Wednesday one is Leicester uh, Tottenham. Seems that seems that Steve Cooper is doing kind of like a profit and sustainability rules tour because ma- from managing Nottingham Forest that have seen points in action to now managing uh, Leicester, which is very likely is going to get a point in action uh, along the the season. There is a clear change in style from Maneska to, to Steve Cooper. Uh, their best player in the championship, Drewsbury Hall, also left for. For, for Chelsea, so everything looks like it's going to be a very difficult season, this comeback for, for Leicester. Maybe we're going to have to enjoy one of the last dances of, of Jamie Vardy. And for Tottenham, uh, Tom Postecoglou, we have to deliver something this season, a cup final or a Champions League uh, spot. Uh, Solanke is a good, very good addition. If maybe 60 million is too much, that's a different uh, discussion. But uh, what's your take here in Leicester, uh, Tottenham? I think Leicester are going to struggle massively, massively this season. I'd be quite surprised if they got above 25 points, above 30 points. Um, and I think there are potentially going to be some points deductions coming this season as well. Again, you mentioned it. We'll talk about it later. But uh, I think that may well be coming down the pipe. Um, I'm amazed Jamie Vardy's still going. You know, there's very few players these days still older than me in the Premier League. So I'm happy to see it. But um, yeah, incredible. They're still going to be relying on him a bit to score goals. He will need to score 10 goals this season somehow from somewhere. He won't start every game, but he will start some. Uh, and look, I'm not impressed by their business as well because they ain't got much money. Bobby Deco over Reed from Fulham. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah. He's a good enough player. Uh, for Kundo Buenanote, he's okay. He's a good player. He's all right. You know, it's fine. But not wildly impressed. And then beyond that, what else are we looking at? Nothing really because they can't make moves. Um, and so we'll see. Look, I think they'll struggle. I think they'll struggle in a lot of games this year. But I have a weird one for you. We'll get to it. In terms of Tottenham, I like Dominic Solanke. He's better than Richarlison, right? The, the no, money that's is, for sure. The money's neither here nor there. He will lead the line. He will lead the press. He will constantly work. He will score goals. That's a smart signing from Tottenham, and I think they've got that right. Beyond that, I don't know if this is a particularly strong Tottenham squad. I I'm seeing a lot of people predicting this morning, and look, I'm, I'm here to be proved wrong, right? That they're going to be in the top four. I think they are no better than Villa, Newcastle, West Ham, Man United. These squads that are going to be in their battle, trying to look at third, trying to battle for fourth, being in the top six. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I think that they've got some, some decent players. I'm not saying they're going to really struggle, but I'm not seeing a great improvement from last season. And there are moments where the tactics of the manager are just baffling. And the all-out attack they do at points is is naive, frankly. You know, we can we can say, oh, I won this and that for some team in Japan until we're blue in the face or won a league at Celtic. So what? Um, I, 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 I just think that at times they are naive. And I think Foster Cogger needs to have learned from the mistakes of last season for them to replicate what they did in the last campaign, which was mainly built on a brilliant opening 10. And then it all sort of fell apart from there. Um, so look, I, I do think Tottenham will still finish top seven. I wouldn't go any higher than that. In terms of this game, look, it's a nothing bet to say Tottenham win, right? Fine. Yeah. Take a Tottenham win if you feel like it. It's a nothing bet to say Tottenham win, they score two or three goals. So look, if you fancy Tottenham, bet on them to score two or three. I think Solanke is a good signing. They may well win this 3-0. So look, that's a real safe bet. Leicester are five here just to win, four to one. And we mentioned it earlier with Ipswich. That first game throws up anomalies. I don't necessarily fancy Ipswich. I don't necessarily fancy um, the other promoted team, Southampton at Newcastle. But I don't know something about this. King Power Stadium, Monday night football, back in the big time. Uh, Tottenham Hotspur, notoriously crumbly in games like this. If they can get momentum, if they can get the first goal, new manager bounce, all of it, I don't know. The safe bet is Tottenham win without conceding. The crazy bet is Leicester win at four to one, go for it. Wow, that could bring uh, some money for for sure. And again, the center that I said with Ipswich Liverpool, uh, that first half double chance, not crazy money, one seventy five, but still not uh, not bad. That's uh, everything. Then you need to know about Masse one, the Premier League great analysis and, and tips from from Tom Brainy. Before we go, Tom, what's your safe bet, Anaka? Safe bet this week is Arsenal to win at home against Wolverhampton Wanderers. It's even safer if you add it to win to nil, but to keep it safe in the group accumulator, just go Gunners win. Accumulated this week is a four-team bet, a four-team acker. Some real nice ones in here. The big guns are all there. 
Man United to win against Fulham on Friday night football. Yeah. Arsenal to win against Wolverhampton Wanderers at home. Liverpool to win at Ipswich. And you bung in Man City at Chelsea as well. 4.23 for four big favourites to win on the opening day. I love it. <laughs> Tom, a pleasure as always. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Okay. Guys, thank you for watching and do not forget to like, subscribe and hit notifications bell. Bye-bye.